yeah ready okay you can start okay all right so let me begin by welcoming you all for this isc tifr webinar series so very good morning to our today's speaker and good evening and whatever the time you are in different parts of the world so this series was conceptualized by myself and my colleague professor jodhisman das gupta in tifr uh, during lockdown uh, we increasingly felt that students are missing out uh, sort of a physical interaction and the learning objective is missing however we both felt that uh, the the complexity of the subject we could not communicate uh, and there was a always a gap of communication between student community and teacher so we increasingly felt that we should invite the leading scientist uh, who is uh, sort of uh, you know conceptualizing the forefront research ideas any given subject and we have been very very lucky to you know find fantastic series of set of speakers we also felt that one talk is not sufficient enough uh, essentially to convey the ideas so we always uh, requested the speaker to divide these tutorial style talks so one is to just to introduce the subject and then go in a second talk a little bit more in advanced uh, uh, topic so this is the way we have conceptualized this uh, webinar series uh, last year sometime in the month of uh, november 2020 and now we are almost completing the one year or so so with this i will now uh, hand over to uh, professor jyotishman das gupta to formally introduce today's speaker professor richard sir jd over to you okay thank you thank you satish um so uh, it's of course a, a warm welcome to all of you who have joined again for the second part of this lecture series by uh, professor richard zair as we fondly uh, call him dick um so it's very hard to actually introduce a person of stature of uh, you know dick stature simply because it's a, the, the amount of work um, dick has done over his entire period of uh, scientific life is um is just not just enormous but it it, it has so much uh, sort of footprint along of things that we actually use or do uh, as physical chemists as analytical chemists as uh, you know just maybe even now organic chemists so um so i think it's it's, it's impossible for me to uh, just uh, you know collate some of this in a two minute or a one minute uh, sort of introduction but i would like to say he has been one of the most influential physical chemists in the last 50 years and um he has sort of expanded the way we look at reaction dynamics uh ever since his own phd with uh, professor dudley harshbach which he did at uh, harvard university uh in chemical physics uh actually long time back he finished in 1964 um since then uh he has been in various positions and enriched the science um wherever he has been uh he was uh, after finishing his phd uh he did uh, a postdoc uh, at uh, Jila which is the joint institute uh, for laboratory and astrophysics in university of colorado where um, he was there for at least a year and then he started his own lab at mit and then came back to university of colorado and then uh, after a few years uh, in university of colorado he moved to columbia university as a full professor where he was there for quite some time uh, till uh, you know he joined stanford university in roughly in the 80s um he has been at stanford for all these years for almost now um you lost him what happened jyotishman <laughs> audio is not good frozen i think he is frozen now jd <laughs> yep so it's like it, everybody it, else is we are except jd jd i think maybe uh, uh, i think uh, dick me want to share your screen maybe you can start <laughs> thank you for the jd is I, i appreciate yes i think he he we, okay. we lost him he had a this internet issue yesterday also oh, yeah. 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 yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. So, um 
So back. sorry, sorry, I just lost my internet, Satish. Yes, sure. Please go ahead. Please, please <laughs> and, complete, complete. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so this this interest in uh, water micro droplets, aqueous micro droplets, this has been a rage in his group in recent times, and especially uh, also. We are losing him on time to time. Yeah, maybe you can start. Yeah. Yeah, yes, let's start. Sorry for so, that. My, my developing mass spec as it was for last year. And, <laughs> and it, it's, really been, it's really been amazing journey for him uh, for the last, you know, discovering organic chemistry reactions in aqueous micro droplets. So um, with those words and, and just um, telling that, Dick, you have been a blessing to many of us in India because the way you have supported Indian scientists and scholars is just incredible. And that support has led to many of us having a... <laughs> I appreciate the sentiments, even though they're... Uh, they're not just up. Things, because you had said something good. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 that's okay. Uh, I, and with that, I would like to call on Dick and, um, and, and uh, we'll start the second talk. And uh, Dick, over to you. Yes. Thank you so much. I hope you're able to see the slide I put up. It I is. thought I should try to answer some questions that were asked of, of, of me. Okay. Uh, and so I wanted to show you uh, why I was actually arguing to you that, that water uh, much more dissociates, uh, autoionizes at the interface uh, of, of a, a, a droplet in air. And here's some experiments done by Colusi and co-workers in, in 2012. You can see the reference where this was published at, at Caltech. And what they did is they, they fired um, a, a jet of hexanoic acid, C5H11COOH, at a stream of water droplets. And they could vary the pH of the water droplets. And they also put hexanoic acid into the water droplet without firing anything at it. So you have both in water and on water in terms of what's happening. And what do you see? First of all, a big difference is if you look at this graph, the pH dependence of the deprotonation of hexanoic acid dissolved in water behaves exactly as expected from the pKa value of this compound. So what we're looking at, at is the red. And the red part goes just what you expect. But it's evident that the gaseous acid species are deprotonated at much lower pH. Look, look at pH around two. It's there. It's being deprotonated. Okay. And the behavior is in, in, interpreted as, as uh, quantifying the concentration of hydroxide or bicarbonate anions on the droplet surface. They thought only hydroxide, but we since learned that bicarbonate is very important. Uh, hexanoic anions are found at pH values as low as two. And in other experiments, they found that hydronium cations were found for pH values up to four. And therefore, it was concluded that the air-water interface is neutral around pH equal three. That's 10 to the minus three, okay? For every H plus, there's an OH minus. So there's another 10 to the minus three OH minus. And the KW at the surface is what I was telling you, that it's like 10 to the minus six. Instead of being 10 to the minus 14, it's more like 10 to the minus six. This is eight orders of magnitude difference. And, and it starts to make you hopefully understand why chemistry at the water droplet interface is going to be so potentially different than in bulk water. And here I, I, I urge you to look at some beautiful experiments, for example, that, that, that Natamani Elume did, did uh, in, in which she's able to actually show new, new pathways that open up in chemistry uh, by carrying out the process at, at, at water droplets. And he's, he's at uh, IIT Ruriki. Okay, and now I want to talk again about hydrogen peroxide as to where it's coming from. So at or near the surface of the water drop, but you believe me now, you got lots of H plus and OH minus, I hope. And O2 gas comes in from the air. Okay, and it, it gets protonated to form HO2 plus. Some of it does. 
and the HO2 plus goes to an OH minus, and there's a very large electric field that helps things along too. And I think it forms the hydroperoxide radical OH and the hydroxyl radical OH, HOO, and the other one's OH. And they go on to, I think, form hydrogen peroxide. So we have a possible way that hydrogen peroxide gets formed. Um, and uh, okay, so these are, the, I just wanted that people wanted to know what's going on, where the electron go on the OH minus. And I'm trying to show you uh, that this is very likely what, what's happening. Uh, now let's turn to today's talk, which will be about micro droplet chemistry. And um, I'm going to go and remind you of some background. First, please look, this is played five times. Okay, here's food coloring gel in water. We have diffusion, okay, in a liquid. And I'm reminding you what that is. What else do we have? Okay, here now we're gonna have a, a plus and minus electrodes. Here's an electric field and look what happens. Plus charges go to the anode, right? <laughs> minus charges go to the cathode. And indeed, things which are dipolar get oriented. And we've seen some beautiful experiments showing this orientation. What about if we have a beaker of water and we apply all this to the outside? Sure enough, things move, you know, in terms of, of, of electrodes, but in, indeed, there's a screening and you get actually no electric field penetrating into the water, okay, just at the outside. This is gonna be very different when I get to a water droplet that's small. Which I'm going to show you. Uh, and now, why why do we uh, care about multi drop multi uh, about uh, micro droplet chemistry? And I'm showing you for diameters about one to ten or twenty microns. We have all types of things: atmospheric chemistry, coronavirus. We talked about yesterday. Uh, people who are interested in vaping, I don't recommend it. Okay, cells about the same size as cells, microfluidics for medical diagnostics, mass spectrometry, and we, we hope industry, okay, certainly and we can paint cars this way, <laughs> okay, and catalysis, which we're learning about. So lots are possible. Uh, we've seen lots of chemical reactions are accelerated. Uh, some beautiful work of JQ Lee, for example, uh, early on show, showing uh, how um, you could uh, de, uh, make, a, make a cytochrome C unfold. And many other people have shown, um, again, uh, uh, beautiful work of uh, uh, Shibdis Banerjee in, in, in my lab on synthesis. And you get huge reaction rate accelerations. And, and Graham Cooks has started this stuff off too, very much so in his group. And we, we see what we expect. We have a, 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 a orientation and we have an energy term. It's a normal thing. Um, and why is it that micro droplet chemistry is so different? Okay. And uh, we really have the interface to thank for this. And uh, uh, we find lots of surface bound species, increased concentrations. They're aligned to the surface or really con controlling orientation. Uh, and we have some altered energy going on. We have a very strong surface electric field. And this leads to some questions, which we'll try to get some answers to. What is the strength of the electric field? I'll show you that. Why does the droplet radius matter? I hope to convince you that really is related to the double layer that's being formed. And why are small concentrations more effective? And I'll answer that right away by reminding you that I'm talking about that the real action takes place at the surface. And so if you just load up the whole system, you can only use that which is at the surface. So some of these effects saturate as you go to higher um, amounts of material that are dissolved in the water. Okay, and this is the picture I've, I've tried to advertise to you before. I, I, I wanna go over this and I, I hope you'll, you'll, you're now believing me. The droplet has negative ions that come to the surface. Um, and people still argue what they all are, but there's beautiful work done done in France, I think that showed that it was the carbo carboxylates, very, the, the bicarbonates very important, okay? Um, and uh, what else do we see? 
we, we see that if we have an overall neutral system, that it'll pull positive charges towards the negative charges. There'll be less negative charges inside the droplet. And we're actually going to set up, as I'm going to show you, a gradient, and there'll be an electric field that goes from the center, which tends to be neutral, it has to be, uh, that's zero all the way out. And you'll see if you separate electrons, electric negative charges from positive charges, you get an electric field. And uh, we'll be talking about that. Now, what, 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 is, what is the simple model? This is now an ionic surfactants at the interface of some sort, and we get electromigration, okay? We expect the, these things happen. This is a simple model, and there's a nice publication by, by um, graduate student uh, Christian Chamberlain on this that I recommend um, to you to look at. And we have diffusion. So the two are fighting each other. Remember, diffusion wants to you know, equilibrate the system, make it all homogeneous. Uh, electromigration wants to pull charges uh, positive next to negative. And so now let's get quantitative. And I promised you this would be a deeper lecture, but I hope it's going to be a clear one. You can interrupt me anytime. Let's consider a surface density of one charge per 100 square nanometers. This is actually a very low amount of charge on the surface. It's easy to get 10 times more than this. Um, and we're going to look on a 10 micron, 10 micron diameter droplet. So that means a five micron radius, okay? 10 micron diameter droplet. And let's work it out. So first thing is the surface area. Well, that's for a sphere, after all, surface tension. So it's four pi r squared. I, I put in the, this, and r is 10 over two, but we have it squared, so the force cancel. I have pi times 10 to the eighth, okay? Uh, nanometer squared surface area. Now I know the surface area for this of, of our of our droplet, a 10 micron diameter droplet, okay? And uh, at one charge per uh, 100 square nanometers, that is going to be, uh, okay, uh, a hundredth of this. So we're going to have 3.14 times 10 to the 6 charges on the surface. So, so far, you hopefully agree. And... That means there's 3.14 times 10 to the minus six opposite charges in the volume of the droplet that have to be neutral. And this corresponds to, if you work it out, five times 10 to the minus 18 moles in a concentrations of about 10 micromolar, so not much, okay? And now let's convert this into coulombs. And to do that, we need to know what the charge of an electron is in terms of coulombs, and that's put in here, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Trust me about the math, it comes out to be about 5 times 10 to the minus 13 coulombs. Not much, okay? The electric field at the radius 5 microns from a sphere of charge containing 5 times 10 to the minus 13 coulombs is, well, okay, the, the charge Q over 4 pi um, epsilon naught uh, these are the dielectric constants. Uh, uh, that's the, the vacuum. Epsilon R of the, of the actual solution, R squared. Okay, I'll put in 78.4. Um, um, hopefully, Professor Bogchi will correct me and tell me that the number is even smaller uh, at the interface, but we'll just take it as simple, okay? It's 78.4. Uh, and uh, I've put in the numbers. I've done the math, as you see here, and you come out with 2.3 times 10 to the 6 volts per meter, okay? Two, and please, this is a huge electric field strength, okay? Uh, this is 10 to the 8 volts per centimeter, showing you in this simple calculation. Can I remind you, if I make um, about 10,000 volts per centimeter in air at atmospheric pressure, I get... Uh, a discharge, I get breakdown. This field is small compared to what an electron feels in a hydrogen atom from a proton in the nucleus, but it is very large compared to what fields we can apply in the laboratory. And this is what I expect to find from this calculation, this simple calculation. This is an underestimate, probably, of the electric field at the interface. 
and that's going to have big consequences. Okay, um, and uh, many interfaces have have electric fields. People in biology, uh, no, bio, bio, biochemistry, get involved in this all the time. But I'm telling you, droplets are going to be the same way. And uh, now I want to show you some some effects uh, of what is happening. I want to show you that 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 uh, I could just get this to go away. I just wonder what we do. Just put it down here. Okay, micron-sized water droplets induce spontaneous redox reactions. Water doesn't make redox reactions, but droplets do. And I'm going to show you this. Here is a very simple setup. You can easily do this. A syringe pump, a silicon capillary, okay, silica capillary, right? Just glass capillary of some sort, a nebulizing gas to make the droplets come out. Uh, and of course, it we can vary what it is. Here's micro droplets, and we're going to send them into the inlet of a mass spectrometer, and we can vary the distance, the reaction distance. This is a setup, very common setup. Please notice, this is not what's called, uh, 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 what do we call it? Uh, 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 desorption, this is not electrospray, okay? Electrospray involves using an electric field there's no electric field being applied to this setup. There is no catalyst being added to the solution. There is no electric field. We're just going to spray droplets. Okay. Now, for some reason, it doesn't go on. It doesn't like to. Aha, here we go. And, I, and I'll show you so, some work. This is, this is work done by uh, Devlina Samanta. Um, and she's just joining now uh, uh, on the faculty of the University of Texas at Austin with uh, J.Q. Lee and others in my group. This is the conversion of pyruvate to lactate. I'm showing you pyruvic acid or pyruvate, and you see it, I um, hope I can point this out, on the left here. The normal way it's done in, done in us and our muscles is NADH and NAD. This is the lactate dehydrogenase to form uh, lactic acid. And the conversion of pyruvate to lactate is enzymatically catalyzed by lactate dehydrogenase. And in this reaction, the pyruvate, you see here, gains two electrons. That means it becomes reduced and is converted to lactate. Okay. And the NADH is oxidized. It loses two electrons and is converted to NAD. And lactate dehydrogenase converts. Pyruvate, the final product of glycolysis, to lactate when oxygen is absent or in short supply. And that's why your muscles ache with exercise, right? Okay, we, we know this. Fine. But if you put pyruvic acid into bulk water, believe me, it's pyruvic acid. Nothing happens. But look, if you spray it, we see lactate. Now, the, it turns out that sensitivity for detecting lactate is less than that of pyruvate but you'll see there's much more lactate. So this really is happening. And it's happening, as I've mentioned to you, this is a, a two electron process. And we're seeing, uh, we've done this with many things now. We've seen re redox reactions happening in droplets. And I'm showing you as a function of distance, uh, what this is like. And so this is the mass spectra of 10 micron diameter pyruvate in micro droplets, uh, 10 micromolar di uh, pyruvate in micro droplets at different traveling distances. And uh, we can now do a calculation of redox efficiency. And I, I don't know how you feel, but when I go to lectures and people do math for me, I, I need to later study the math. I can't do it sitting and hearing people talk about it, but just know what I've done. I'm looking at the, at the ionization efficiency, the concentration, the intensity, and, uh, and obviously it is the concentration times the ionization efficiency. And I've done all this and I've gotten the reduction percentage from this. And now I'm actually going to measure it. And I'm showing you as a function of moving the distance, which is the same as the time. This thing goes on and it goes on to, to make a reduction efficiency nearly of 100%, as you're seeing here. And I also look at it as a function of concentration. For low concentrations, okay, this is a nanomolar. This goes fine, but as I up the concentration, the reduction efficiency goes down. This is the saturation effect I was telling you about. It's really good when it's not concentrated. 
make more concentration. You just, over the period of time, you can't do it. It doesn't come to the surface. Okay. And uh, it's, to me, it's impressive. But now let's go further and try to understand it. And here, I'm going to show you the work, uh, thesis work uh, of Christian Forrest Chamberlain. Some of this still needs to be written up. Um, and let, let's start to make a very simple steady state continuum treatment. And I'm defining for you um, on the left, okay, the ion mobility the, the, of so species A, the uh, local concentration of A in moles per cubic meter, the electric field, okay, okay, which would be volts per meter in this. Okay, the diffusion coefficient, uh, uh, the, the Boltzmann constant, temperature, okay, and the charge of an, uh, of an electron or something. This should be a superscript. I see there, I should now make that 10 to the minus, you know, minus 19 uh, ch charge. See, I'll have to fix that in the future. Okay, and here we are. There's going to be a system that's set up at steady state. There's no flux. There's a balance that's going on between two forces. What are they? We are balancing the action of the electric field against diffusion, electromigration versus diffusion. That's why I showed you in the beginning the two effects. And look at them. I'm taking them for a, for a unit charge, ZA equals one. And I, I'm showing you that one involves the, the, the uh, diffusion. Okay, here we are. That's the diffusion constant right here. Uh, and the gradient of the concentration, that's the just driving the fusion. Uh, no gradient, nothing happens. With a gradient, we expect it to diffuse. And here we are showing you the electric field that's driving the system to uh, by, by uh, what you call electromigration. And now let's remind ourselves, you can solve for E, that's just math, easy algebra, right? And now, I need to know how to express the the diffusion coefficients. And if I do something called Stokes-Einstein, that'll be the ion mobility times the Boltzmann constant and temperature over the charge. I substitute for dA in this expression, and I now have the electric field in terms of, notice, the gradient of the concentration over the concentration and some other constants. And now what I'm going to do is use Gauss's law in this form, okay? And I'm going to actually uh, actually uh, work this out and put it, because I have a sphere, I'm gonna put it into spherical coordinates. And if I assume a spherical droplet of radius R and switch to polar coordinates, okay, I get a differential equation to solve with boundary conditions, which, which, which has been done. It, and we're going to actually solve it for what's happening for different situations. And uh, I think at this point, you get the idea, and I wanted you to see what's going on, that we really are looking at the physical chemistry basis for uh, why things are going to be the way they are. And what do we find? We find that it depends on the number of unpaired ions. As I told you, you put so many of the ions on the outside, and then you deplete some on the inside. And we're going to go from there being very, very few, like 10 to the minus 10 molar, to being more like 10 to the minus 5 molar, okay? Uh, that's 10 micromolar, okay? This is unpaired ions. And, uh, and we see if we now look at radial distance, okay? Uh, this is going to be a 20 micron droplet in this case. We're looking at concentrations of species A, okay, that indeed, as we, as we get a, 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 a more ions built up, this thing peaks as we go to the, the, the periphery. And uh, hopefully you, you, you see this sharp increase. This is the distribution of ions changed markedly with different average concentrations of unpaired ions. And we see that this goes on <coughs> all the way in um, with some distance. And these are distances in microns, not nanometers. These are microns, and they're really penetrating into this droplet. 
And so let me take you take you and show you yet another example. Uh, it's a lot of calculations here that I, I'm not bothering you with, but here's a diameter of five microns. We're going to take here a, a, a hundredth of an ion per per uh, nanometer squared. So there's one ion per every hundred nanometers squared. So it's not much. And we're going to take a negative, negative strong electrolyte and a positive strong electrolyte. These strong electrolyte means you completely dissociate. This is the picture I've tried to show you before. And I'm also going to take into account that water breaks apart into H plus and OH minus. And we're going to include that in the calculations. And here's what we're starting to see. Okay, now this is now effects of weak electrolytes on electric double layers and ion distributions. A lot to be learned from this. This is a weak acid buffer, and this is the distance from the boundary. Here's the bulk solution, okay? Here's where the boundary is. See, distance from boundary. This is the electric double layer. Here's the bulk solution. And we are releasing that there are gradients and, and things are happening that we see that H plus wants to go there. Remember, it's a negative surface. We and uh, we see that A minus is is whatever it is is depleted because of there's very minus charges there as we as we go away. Uh, there is often a thought given, uh, and certainly we teach this that you know you can control the pH of a system by adding a buffer. Uh, I'm showing you in a, in a in a little micro droplet, adding a buffer doesn't work. It, you still have a, a a gradient because because you can't cancel it all out. You got this balance going on. Uh, and uh, this will become, so a bunch of math later, I'm showing you, th this is the pH. And, and, and look, please, uh, I, I hope you're, you're starting to see what I've done. This pH appears to go from uh, about five to about eight, right? Over this, this, this is micro droplet center uh, for this system. This is the H plus ion concentration. And we have actually a gradient in pH uh, with all this. Agreed? And what else do we find? This is now the concentrations of these species. How OH minus is, it gets more depleted, how H plus gets increased, and the different ions that are, that are involved as a function of distance now of a five micron diameter that means 2.5 microns in radius, and you see I'm doing from the center onto the edge uh, for, for this type of work. Uh, that now you might say, well, is there any reality to these calculations? And I think there is. Here's some beautiful work that's, that was done uh, uh, at um, Virginia Tech. Uh, and uh, this is now looking at the distance from the droplet as they actually use silver particles to do SIRS, uh, to actually see what happens. And, there's, and they, as they do this, and if you plot this, this is distance from the droplet center, and they move this around, and they see a pH change. Look at the pH change. It's going over many orders of magnitude. Uh, and th that's what they reported. Um, and he here is the uh, electric field, OK? Uh, going to look at it again, too. Uh, and we can calculate it. Look at the electric field. The electric field uh, is now measured in volts per meter. And this case is going up towards 10 to the 6, as I told you. And it's going to, 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 to very little at the, at, the, at the center of the micro droplet. And at the edge of the micro droplet, we get this, this value. Uh, OK. Well, you, you might now say, OK, this is what you're calculating. But well, what is? What do you really see if you do this? And I want to first emphasize to you, because of the nature of a sphere, 48% of the droplet volume is between 2 and 2.5. OK, so a lot of the droplet, when it's a small droplet, is really uh, very close to the, to the periphery. In fact, we'll go back and forth and interchange with the periphery. This will explain to you why droplets of a certain small size really are active compared to large droplets. And of course, if too small, we'll, this will go away. We won't, we won't develop the double layer. This is beautiful work that was done at Columbia University. Uh, I sent 
uh, J.Q. Lee to join um, Wei Min and his student, uh, Shang, who's now, I believe, at, 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 at Beida, Peking University in, in Beijing. A anyways, what was looked at was using this uh, nitrile bearing fluorescent probe that's shown here in the circle, okay, and looking at the Stark effect. If you have a big electric field, there should be a Stark effect. And they use the technique as shown here in which they're able to, to, to actually uh, uh, use fluorescence to, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure P Professor uh, Puspento Das would love this, okay, um, and, and actually see the Stark shift that comes from this. Um, and wow, okay. Uh, and there's a big shift, about five wave numbers. And from this, they're able to calculate the electric field. And they found the electric field, this is in oil in this case, to be 10 to the seventh volts per centimeter. Okay, 10 to the ninth volts per meter. The, 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 these are, um, are big, big, okay, electric fields. And, and they're there. And this is now showing you the electric field shape dependence on droplet size. And I've tried to emphasize to you that is you, if you make the droplet size one micron, it looks like this. If you make it, however, 20 microns, it doesn't matter so much until you get close to the surface. And it'll really start to go away if I make a much larger thing, just, just at the surface. And so there exists a transition from nanoscale droplets wherein the electric double layer of the nano droplet from opposite sides of the droplet fully overlap to larger droplets wherein the electric double layer is at the surface with a separate interior bulk solution to the micro droplet. Only micro droplets not too large and not too small show appreciable effects from the electric field caused by the presence of the EDL. I'm back to telling you about Goldilocks effects, things that are intermediate. I, I think I want to for a moment stop and and have you think about this. There is very much an idea that's been very successful and popular in science that the way we understand things is we always look at the simplest things and we build from the simplest outwards. But be careful because if we really take that attitude, all of us would, would continue to be studying quarks. And we'd never learn anything about chemistry from just studying quarks, I believe, okay? It won't work that way. There are phenomena that happen at different length scales that are not gonna happen at other length scales of what goes on. And this is an important idea, an important idea of, of complexity, uh, okay? And balancing forces, mesoscience. Anyways, to go on, electric field effects on chemical reaction rates. And we're gonna look at some of them. And uh, they, they are a react in alignment and uh, solvent cage uh, rearrangements, okay? And transition state stabilization. Transition state tends to be more polar generally than the things that make it up. And so it, electric field will have an effect on lowering it. And uh, here are some beautiful experimental evidence of electric field done by Matt Cannon and his group at Stanford. And this is not our work. This is his, their work. And they're looking at this compound one, okay, that can form either two or three. And they're looking at this as a function of electric field. And so they have an electrode, they have an insulator, okay, a reaction solution, another electrode. And here's what they see. They see that the ratio of two to three changes at no voltage, you see, the, the ratio is uh, simply that there's almost all three, no two. Okay, but if they change either, in either direction, plus five or minus five, which really shows you this electric field effect, uh, they can really make the three take off. Uh, and so I think it's a dramatic example showing how an electric field influences chemistry. Well, we sort of know this, and, and again, my, my colleague, Steve Boxer, is, is well known for showing that in, in enzymatic enzymes work by the effect of the electric field and measuring against Stark effects and so on. And we're seeing this all over. It's actual electric fields that push electrons around. And pushing electrons around, as all well, my colleagues in organic chemistry know, <laughs> okay, is what easily explains a lot of chemical reactivity. 
So, okay, so let's talk about it. Micro droplet effects on reactions. We have partial solvation at the surface. Um, lovely work by Graham Cooks and coworkers really demonstrating that. Uh, concentration effects, okay, electric field effects, they're all there. And they're in and they are related to each other. It's not just one or the other. They're 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 intertwined, I believe. Let, let's now open how are we doing for time? We're okay still, I think. Let's talk about uh, further this electric field and what's what's happening. What role does electric double layer play in redox reactions at planar electrostatically charged surfaces? We made that calculation, and I think it's it's in press, uh, though it may be able to download it at this point. And if I do electrochemistry by discharging a static a static charge off of a single electrode, what is the voltage? And you all know that you you can commonly think walk on a carpet, go to a metal doorknob, and get yourself shocked. Okay, and we know there's a there, that you can develop a voltage, um, and so that's the change in electrostatic potential energy. And you might well think that's what is going to be important, and that's what I initially thought was important. But I'm going to show you something else is even more important. Here is the micro droplet as a capacitor. Okay. After all, we've separated the charges. That's what a capacitor's like, uh, right? Here, here it is. Here are all the S surfactant negative ions, okay? And that looks to me a lot like a capacitor. And we're going to talk about a chemical reaction, which in some sense discharges the capacitor. We're going to find out to what extent can we regard a droplet as an electrochemical cell, as a battery, okay? And so here's micro droplet as a capacitor. And we're going to look at a reaction, and I'm going to look at the the surface S minus the the uh, anionic material going to something inside. I'm going to make it just a neutral, for example, and forming N minus plus S naught. And I'm trying to hopefully show you that in this cartoon. Okay, reaction, and they go on in. Okay, and it's N minus, and I want to know what's driving this process. And I look at the micro droplet as a capacitor. I'm going to take five microns. Again, only 0.01 ions per nanometer squared, negative strong electrolyte, 100 nanomolar, positive strong electrolyte, 64.5 micromolar. Okay. Remember, the negative has been, has been removed compared to the positive because I, I have altogether neutral. And I look at all this. And I'm looking at the surface charge, and I'm, I'm working this out, and it's varying. And from this, I can calculate that I'm developing in this process a potential a, 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 of 38.1 millivolts. Okay, that's not much. 38.1 millivolts comes from this process of doing this. And uh, now, here is the pH gradient also changes. As we do this, we are depleting the negative charges on, on the top, uh, at the periphery, and we're going to be changing the pH gradient. This means everywhere locally that H plus and OH minus are in equilibrium, and it's going to be changing. We're going to be combining H plus and OH minus because we always want to keep this one times 10 to the minus to take some, some number in there uh, of, of what's happening. Okay? And so we, we look at this. And we're going to do the micro droplet in some sense now as a battery for driving this process. And here you have two chemical reactions, one driving the other. And I'm telling you, we're going to drive H plus and OH minus to recombine to form water as we change the system. And when we do this, we find, at least to my surprise, that it was 73.0 millivolts were produced by this process. There's a lot of energy when H plus and OH minus combine to form water. And so if you put the two together, you find out that you get now 100 millivolts uh, driving this reaction. Now, at this point, again, hopefully a lot of you know some electrochemistry. And so that's, that's, a, that's 0.1 volt, okay? Not that much, but something. But I'll remind you, it's easy to imagine that you get 10 times as much depending upon uh, changing the concentrations. And so then you really see I have a I have a possibility of driving all types of redox chemistry, which is what we've seen. 
that's going on. Okay, and I, I think now I'm showing you the process, but I want to reach some conclusions for you. Okay, and, and if I might, I want to emphasize these, these conclusions and see if you agree. What is it that we've gained from these last two lectures? Aqueous droplets are not simply small reaction vessels. There's very much an idea that we have in chemistry that we don't pay a size, we don't pay attention to the size of the container for carrying out a chemical reaction. But when we get to droplets, we should, we must. Okay. And then the next thing I want to say is many reactions can be vastly accelerated in aqueous micro droplets. And as I've mentioned to you, they even lead. This is the third point. The new products can appear in aqueous microdroplet reactions that are not found in bulk aqueous reactions under the same conditions. An example being the redox chemistry that I've just been showing you. And finally, aqueous microdroplets can act as electrochemical cells. So there's lots to be done here, many things to be tried, and all types of, of possible connections. And it, it gets wild. For example, haven't, I haven't gone into it, but it's quite possible that droplets, which are after all clouds, sprays, they're all over the place, may actually have been what helps drive us from non-life to life and, 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 and go in the earth uh, at early times. We don't know, but it is quite interesting to speculate that droplets may be the, the source here. You might say, well, you know, you got to gain energy from something. What are you gaining? Where's the energy? Well, it, it takes energy, believe it or not, to make droplets. Uh, you got to break the hydrogen bonds and water, et cetera, and, and set up droplets. And you get that back, you get that energy back off from the system uh, at the surface. So with this, I think now, uh, let's see if I can do this. Yeah, I'm going to stop share. And um, I, I appreciate all of you uh, being able to join me in this. And I'd be delighted to talk with you about this. Um, but, but I would urge you though, to think about this. Uh, it, these, are, these experiments I've tried to show you, uh, they go all over the place and there's many possibilities of where to take them. Uh, and I've only hinted at some of them. There's much more to be done and uh, here, uh, I thank you for, um, you know, please uh, listening to me to go on about this thing that I'm so enthusiastic about. I love micro droplets. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. I would uh, sincerely request all of you to unmute themselves and just give a round warm of applause to Dick. Thank you. There was a question from attendees. I think okay, he raised. Okay, just panelists, somebody one raised. Vivek, please, can you unmute and go ahead? Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you, Professor Zair, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I was just wondering about. So you had mentioned that uh, you know the extent of these electric extends to a few microns inside the droplet. Uh, I was just curious about. Uh, so you know, in in a typical uh, uh, vibrational some frequency generation experiments at the surface. Uh, they typically say that you know it only or, or signal generation region is really only a few mono layers. So I was just trying to compare uh, you know the length scale into which this electric field extends in, in the droplet versus you know what happens at a flat interface. Uh, you know. I, 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 so I'm very interested in some frequency generation. Some and, and, and beautiful experiments have been done, for example, by Hong Fei Wang and many many other people. Uh, Ken Eisenthal and so on, many, many people. Uh, it, it is much, um, it is very much a surface effect. As you know, you, you go between one surface to another, you have to get in a homogeneous situation. I, I'm showing you uh, that in the case of droplets, that electric field and those gradients penetrate much more deeply. Okay. Not true for a, for a one liter uh, beaker of water. At all with with a with, so this but, is basically a, a shape. droplet really so so this is basically a shape and as you move is... to the little droplet m most of the volume is really close to the surface okay thank you uh, is that, uh, i hope that yeah it does i just wanted to like compare and and, and know okay, and yeah, so there's there's been some lovely micro there's needs to be more work there needs to be more microscope 
microscopic observations in, in the optical to understand better the, the nature of what's happening. Um, I should also just to mention to you the, the, the support for this work so far that we've had, it comes from the United States Air Force. Uh, and I'm very grateful for them for, for doing, for following this work. But uh, their, their interests are, of course, to meet Air Force needs. And I'm showing you this is much bigger than that. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm very worried as to <laughs> how to keep all this going. Thank you. I think Professor Mittal has a question. <clears throat> Yeah, Professor Mittal, can you please go ahead? Yeah. No, Dick, I would like your opinion on the corrosion rate enhancement by this micro droplets. Uh, I've, I've, I have thought about this too, and I, I don't yeah. have an answer, but I actually believe that, that they probably certainly promote corrosion. Yeah, because yeah. that will have a Ab lot of Absolutely, effect. much more than, than just bulk water, than flowing water. But I really think small droplets do that. Because inside the reactor walls, for example, our nuclear reactors, this is a very important problem to have these corrosions. And if they're, because they are water cooled reactors. And uh, if, if, we, if we have a bulk water, fine. But as we go to, 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 to small droplets, then much more corrosion. Yeah. There will and, always be some water vapors on the top of the water. Right. The... And I've, I've wondered about it also in terms of geological effects, in terms of rock, rock weathering. And I've tried to interest people in geology to get interest, to become interested in this. And so far I've failed, but I think they should be interested in this. Hi, Dick. Um, a quick question. So if the micro droplet is to be used as a reactant, and then you introduce all kinds of species into the droplet, so what would you expect uh, the dielectric constants changed and then how this charge distribution is going to change? Uh, I, I wish I were smart enough to fully answer this question. Is, is Beam and Bob G joined us or not? I'm not sure. He has not joined. He has not joined. He has he not. Not. Oh, okay, because he, he would be the person who could answer that better than me, first of all. Uh, I expect the dielectric constant is not 78, that it's much smaller as you go. Yeah, it will be less. It will be, be, be less. Yes, uh, right. but, but what it all is, I, I haven't calculated. I don't know. And I have a feeling that this continuum model is probably not really adequate for calculating at the surface. I don't believe it, okay? Uh, I think you need an atomistic or what do you call it, a, a real molecular model at this point. Uh, so uh, I don't have an answer, but I, I, I uh, and I hope you see, I've given you some models to suggest what's happening, but I don't believe yet I've given you a, a, a calculation that I would fully trust. Is that, is that a fair? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Kian Wang, thank you. Um, uh, now we have Yao Kyun Lee. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hi, Dick. I'm curious. Uh, you just mentioned the size, the size effect, the diameter, not too small, not too large. Seems That's to have right. more strong effect. Yeah. But I'm curious to my imagination. Typically, I think smaller size to narrow scale might be the effect would be more obvious. So no, no, no what happens is you get overlapping friend. double layer from, from the two sides, the opposite sides of the uh of the um what's it what do you call it of, of the sphere. You you don't get a you don't you don't get the electric field built up over you don't integrate it over distance enough to build up an electric field much. And and we really see things go away. There is a special spot that's right to make this go. This is related actually to, to yesterday's lecture too, in which I was showing you about hydrogen peroxide production and such. Did you ever try the size under one micron? Yes, I, I haven't gone below one micron. That I haven't, I haven't done, but I, I know from other people's experiments that if you go re, re, really wall, small water clusters do not contain hydrogen peroxide. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Zaira Hamid, could you unmute yourself and ask the question? Hello, Dean. Zaira here. Hello. Nice to see you. All, all the way from Sweden. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Dick. I also attended your lecture yesterday. It was really an eye opener for me because especially I learned from you that the aeroplanes are really the hotspots for virus spread. And uh, I was always impressed uh, by the Emirates Airways because they claim that they are providing us the cleanest air uh, in the aeroplane. So it is false. So <laughs> I, I just wonder, can we use micro droplet spray to make hydrogen peroxide to kill these kind of pathogens like a coronavirus or other? Uh, well, that, that's what I'm claiming. Yesterday, yeah. and it's, and that, that is good. indeed what I'm saying. And I'm also saying it's not simply hydrogen peroxide. It is what we call, I call ROS, reactive oxygen species. Hmm. I, I forgot to tell you, there's many things we see. We, we, do we have some evidence that there is superoxide, O2 minus, as well as as HO2, as well as OH? There's all types of reactions. Yeah, hydroxide. We have, a, we have a, a reaction reactive soup in here that I need to know more about, and this is an area in which I invite people to, to please explored. help yes. find out more about. There, yes. There's. Okay, look, there's there's so much more work to be done. I, I'm serious. No one group will do it all. Uh, it can't be. Or nor would I. I want it done by more than one group because, I, you know, we, we trust things when we get them repeated by others to see what happens. Thank you so much, Dick. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, questions? Any other questions or comments? If not, I have a question, uh, Dick. Um, so it's also interesting that you can use uh, focused lasers to generate uh, uh, sort of bubbles in water. And in principle, uh, these bubbles can also be very interesting sites for uh, hydroxyl radicals and other kinds of reactive oxygen species at the oh, end. Right. So do, do you, can you compare um, the... Uh, is it very similar to what you see in your generation of the aqua? Uh, uh, so again, un unpublished work d d done by by Chang Liu in, in my research group uh, with JQ Lee shows reactions in in foams in bubbles. Yes. And there okay. they've been. Okay. 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 And uh, bubbles are see we want surface area. Right. And we and water is so different when it's made that way compared to bulk water. Right. I'm, I'm trying to emphasize that to you. Right, right. And do you have any idea what are the typical lifetimes of such reactive oxygen species in your droplets? Uh, like? uh, all I can tell you is short, but I don't know that I don't, I don't know. Okay, okay, okay. But uh, I, some of some of the things that are reactive like hydrogen peroxide, you know, you can keep it in the bottle. To yeah, yeah, that's right. Try to keep it in the dark. It'll be stable and be there right. a long time. But right. but others will go on and react with other things in, in water itself. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank right? you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For example, for OH radicals, you can put some scavengers and look at the fluorescence coming out from that. Like right, two, right, two right. right. And, and, and we've, we've done some of that, as I think I showed you last lecture. We've actually trapped the OH. Right, right, yeah. right, sure. And, okay. and there's more to be done this way. There's a lot of work here that needs to, to, to investigate. Okay. Uh, I, I hope I'm showing you that, that there is an area of chemistry, which I call, call interfacial chemistry, yes that a lot of us have not paid much attention to. You know, we don't teach this, at least I don't teach this, to beginning chemistry at all. And yet and yet, these questions of corrosion and other things are really important as to right. when we bring things together. Right. Very practical too. Yeah. yeah. We have much more still to learn. Chemistry is not at an end. <laughs> right. Absolutely. At all. Absolutely. Okay, okay. Well, if... Uh, I just would like to just check the YouTube uh, ones. And I think there is just one question, how to measure surface charge. I think uh, that that's a question from Professor Ravitra Pandey. 
Uh, he's actually a sound frequency generation expert as well. So. Uh, pe people people have done such things as as Faraday cup measurements. They actually can measure in in droplets their charge. They also do electromigration. There's there's right. a whole um, work done on that that gives you the idea of the, of the charge on the droplet. Right. And uh, right. so you can. Uh, right. I haven't done anything here myself on this, but it needs to be looked at more. <clears throat> Okay, great. Um, I think uh, we will end it there, Dick. Uh, there, Thank there's you. been a huge amount of interest in these two lectures and uh, the kinds of questions that have ranged. I think this, is, this has been excellent in some sense that you've covered uh, biology on these bike micro droplets um, and then actually organic chemistry kind of reactions in the micro droplets. But it all comes down to really very interesting physics of electric fields and the generation of reactive oxygen species. I think that's wonderful as a as a you know um, as a learning for all of us because I think we would we would like to think more about it and maybe take this in the different laboratories that we actually are. Some of us are interested in reaction dynamics and others in condensed phase. So thank you, thank you, Dick, for enumerating that. Uh, Again, I would like to thank, thank you. I would like to also thank the ACS for their continued support uh, for this lecture as well. A, a big shout out to Diksha Gupta and Ajay Jha for uh, putting uh, uh, money into these lecture series. And uh, I would also like to thank everyone here uh, for joining in for two of these lectures. I know uh, it starts at it started at 7 p.m. Uh, sometimes it's sometimes it's uh, end of the day, but I, I am grateful all... that you that you that you let me do that at this time because <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> no, but 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 whenever I think some of us in the audience know whenever there is a chance to hear you, we will not you know you know have <laughs> sure. better night. Yeah. So so this is this is this is great. So thank you. I just wanted to also say from me and Satish uh, that uh, uh, this has these lectures have helped us. Uh, especially the students here in both the institutes as well as across and they will be available on YouTube uh, links which I can share to some of you if you ask me the email uh, you can send me an email and these will be available to you as well to the three TIFR YouTube channel so yep. thank you very much for joining in uh, Dick we will send you a, a small token of appreciation for this lecture series um, uh, through a snail mail so please look out for that. So thank you. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Dick. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye, yeah. Dick. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks, thank you. Dr. Spawn and Satish. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, thank you Arunan. Thank you, Arunan. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jyotishman, Shantish Patil. Patil. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Jody. Yeah. Bye, Satish. Thank you.